Hello, I'm Bruce Gewertz, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Surgeon-in-Chief at Cedars-Sinai. And it is my pleasure today to uh, be talking to my good friend Ali Azizadeh, who's our Director and Chief of Vascular Surgery. Ali, welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Bruce, for having me. It's really a pleasure, and I'm really excited about this new uh, podcast that you're hosting. <laughs> well, we're delighted to have you. So uh, one of the things that we like to do is talk a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up, and how did you get interested in medicine? For sure. Uh, you know, I'm originally Iranian, and uh, as a um, young uh, teenager, I was displaced by the revolution. So I uh, moved to uh, Texas, where I grew up in Plano, went through high school there. I was always interested in science, uh, and medicine was a natural career path for me because uh, it, was, um, it combined my two greatest interests, which was science and people. And uh, I went to Baylor uh, uh, University in Waco to uh, do an undergraduate degree in uh, biology and ended up doing a medical degree at uh, the same institution in Houston, the Baylor College of Medicine. When did you first realize that you wanted to be a surgeon? You know, as uh, I think as a um, medical student, I was... Um, uh, influenced by uh, the giants in cardiovascular surgery, such as Dr. Michael DeBakey and Dr. Denton Cooley, and um, watching, uh, you know, the effect that they had on both um, uh, management of disease as well as uh, how, uh, you know, uh, the practice of medicine, uh, you know, was... Um, uh, the practice of medicine in, in Houston as, as a young medical student, I think uh, it really uh, opened my eyes to what was possible and the kinds of disease that they were able to treat. So um, I think Dr. Hazem Safi was probably uh, uh, the person that I, in, uh, that I credit with uh, influencing me towards a career in uh, uh, surgery and specifically vascular surgery. Well, Hassam is a, a, an extremely uh, interesting guy and, and with a lot of interests uh, uh, so socially. I, I wonder, uh, it's just so interesting to me that uh, your personality and Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey is quite at odds. <laughs> Did, what was your uh, sense of them uh, and their legacy or if you had contact with For them sure. when you were in training? I think they definitely were, uh, you know, from a different era, uh, but... Um, I, um, you know, I, I guess I would, I injected my own personality into my uh, kind of surgical, uh, you know, as, as a surgeon. And um, uh, along the way, I uh, kind of picked up the uh, kinder, gentler uh, way of, uh, you know, uh, practicing uh, surgery. And um, uh, I, I consider myself a people's person. So to me, uh, the... Um, uh, EQ was just as important as the IQ, and um, I've always, uh, you know, loved people and worked well with them, and uh, I try to make that uh, a part of my uh, uh, daily uh, practice of medicine. Now, I know you went off from Baylor and took a break from Texas and went to uh, train at uh, Washington University in Barnes, which is a terrific place in vascular surgery. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your training there? For sure. Um, you know, I was very fortunate because uh, uh, the uh, beginning of my vascular surgery training uh, coincided with the endovascular revolution. And, um, you know, in the old days, uh, to uh, manipulate a blood vessel, we would have to actually open the patient and uh, uh, fix it uh, directly. Uh, but um, thanks to uh, people like Dr. Juan Perotti and many other pioneers, uh, we were able to manipulate blood vessels from a distant location, like a f you know, uh, getting to the blood to the location of the disease from a um, femoral artery in the groin, for example. So, the the year that I was uh, arriving in St. Louis as a vascular fellow, uh, not only was I um, mentored by uh, Dr. Greg Sicard, uh, but I also had the uh, privilege of working with. Um, uh, Dr. Perotti, who had uh, invented the uh, minimally invasive uh, aneurysm repair, or EVAR. So uh, it was almost um, uh, uh, kind of a uh, dream team to work with. Yeah, that's what makes your career path so unique. I, I mean, I don't know that 
other people have the same balance? Because you were really trained as a sort of a hardcore open surgical person. And then through the uh, luck of timing and the fortune of being at a place that was really at the forefront, you had a chance to learn both. And I, I know now as a vascular surgeon myself that some of our young trainees are really challenged by the fact that they don't have that huge reservoir of open surgical experience. And I wonder if you would comment on that. How do you see that as a training challenge uh, for the young surgeons? Absolutely. I always ask uh, our uh, candidates for vascular surgery what their thoughts are about open versus endovascular techniques and uh, you know what their philosophy is. My approach has always been uh, that they're complementary and not exclusive. So uh, the same way that a surgeon would never operate with one hand versus the other, I think the uh, open and endovascular uh, uh, techniques go together hand in hand and I think uh, uh, it would be uh, the, the young vascular surgeon would be well advised to uh, master both techniques and um, uh, you know with the decline of the open procedures I think we have um, uh, come up with uh, alternative means of training um, uh, our current fellows using uh, simulators and models uh, to be able to uh, do these open procedures. But I think, uh, you know, the future uh, vascular surgeons should be, uh, you know, equally well trained in both techniques. Yeah, well, I, I think I would agree. My, my only concern is that, as you well know, that that experience is very hard earned. Yeah. And uh, being down at the bottom of a deep hole, uh, sewing with uh, 5 or 6 O proline, uh, requires hours and hours and days of uh, training in order to do it. And it seems to me that it's going to continue to be a challenge in the future. For sure, for sure. I'm a uh, fan of Malcolm Gladwell, and as he talks about uh, one of his books, I think it's Outliers, uh, you have to spend your 10,000 hours, you know, to become an expert. And I think uh, uh, young surgeons just have to find the time to, to uh, put in the time to learn those uh, uh, skills and uh, continue to, uh, uh, you know, um, brush them up uh, on a regular basis. So tell me a little bit about what you think are the most uh, uh, interesting applications of endovascular uh, techniques, which for our audience means that you, you place devices and grafts and other things through the arteries themselves through a puncture rather than uh, operating uh, and entering the artery through an incision. But what, what would you say are the, the most spectacular advantages of those kind of approaches? Absolutely. So, you know, blood vessels are like uh, pipes. And I always uh, joke uh, that, you know, vascular surgeons are just glorified plumbers. So uh, when you have a pipe... Uh, such as the aorta, uh, the two most common uh, uh, issues or diseases are either blockages in these pipes or that the pipes become weak and they become a balloon, which is an aneurysm. Uh, so we have been able to, uh, you know, uh, reline these pipes using um, uh, metal mesh, uh, you know, uh, fabric-covered metal mesh, which is a stent graft, to uh, exclude the disease, you know, for example, if the area of the, uh, you know, aorta is ballooned, we can exclude it with a stent graft. Uh, the challenge comes when there are multiple branches coming from these blood vessels, such as in the um, uh, abdomen or belly or around the uh, uh, top of the aorta, which is, which is the aortic arch. So we now have... Um, uh, devices that have uh, actual branches or fenestrations uh, to be able to deal with these, um, uh, you know, uh, branches that uh, lead uh, that supply uh, blood to the rest to to like brain or the uh, liver, intestines, and so forth. Uh, that's one of our biggest challenges currently. We have. Um, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, platforms which uh, are able to deal with these uh, uh, kinds of uh, vascular diseases and the future, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, promising therapies on the horizon. Yeah, so one of the problems with new technology, whether it's in, in vascular disease or, or anything, is that it's very hard to predict the durability of these things. I mean, how long will they last? Uh, what will we need to do to fix them? And do we get in a position 
that fixing a failed device, or in this case a graft, mm -hmm. uh, is even more difficult than, than straightening it out the first time. What's been your uh, personal experience and how do you see the quality control of these devices? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, the, the need for re-intervention or additional procedures is the Achilles heel of endovascular treatments. Uh, because when we open the blood vessel and uh, repair it by hand and sew it, uh, it's, it's a lot more durable. But when you uh, place a stent and it's really kind of relying on radial force and hooks uh, to stay in place, it's not as reliable as an open procedure. So we have to pay great attention to um, uh, the uh, uh, boundary conditions that uh, are present uh, for, uh, you know, use of these devices. Uh, we, in the medical world, we call these instructions for use. So if, for example, a stent needs a, um, a landing zone that is uh, two centimeters long and we landed in a shorter landing zone, uh, it may not be as durable. The uh, analogy would be to try to land a, um, uh, you know, a large jet in a very small runway. So uh, we have to pay attention to those boundary conditions and uh, most of these uh, repairs require, uh, you know, uh, surveillance with um, additional imaging such as CAT scans, ultrasounds and things like that, uh, that we have to continue to follow the patients uh, for a long time. And aren't there some trade-offs in cost? In other words, it seems like the actual insertion and the device cost more than the more traditional open procedure, but the length of stay in the hospital is so much shorter that, that it ends up being uh, financially uh, advantageous. Absolutely. So we, have to, we always have to do a risk-benefit analysis when we want to offer a minimally invasive therapy. And what we um, lose in terms of uh, the device cost, we gain uh, both in ter uh, with regards to um, uh, benefit of reduced uh, morbidity uh, and mortality and reduced length of stay in most uh, cases. Uh, if we use the um, abdominal aneurysm repair for, as an example, uh, you know, in the old days, the patient would have to have an open operation, stay in a hospital for a week to 10 days, uh, and today, we routinely do these procedures uh, through a uh, puncture hole in the groin, and they uh, stay overnight for observation at our home the next morning. So it's a significant benefit for the patient with regards to um, uh, the morbidities of the operation as well as the uh, length of stay. Now, in, in many other fields of medicine, we've been able to avoid uh, even minimally invasive procedures by the development of drugs. Are you aware of any drugs that have had any impact either on the aneurysm, that enlargement of the artery, or the obstructive nature of uh, atherosclerosis? Yeah, that uh, seems to be the um, uh, holy grail of vascular surgery. You know, we have not found a uh, drug that can dissolve plaque. Uh, we've found drugs that uh, can stabilize plaque and maybe um, uh, reduce the cholesterol in the bloodstream. So that's, uh, an, that's an area of research. Uh, we are still trying to identify the mechanism of, uh, you know, um, uh, aortic enlargement. Like what is it that makes a um, aorta, which is a pipe or a cylindrical uh, structure become ballooned out or become an aneurysm and uh, there's significant research going on and some of that is being done here at Cedar sinai with uh, uh, by our um, uh, uh, you know uh, basic science collaborators Dr. Um, Sarah Parker is one of them and we're looking at the mechanism of um, uh, the proteins that um, make up the building blocks of these uh, uh, you know uh, structures or blood vessels uh, and um, we hope that by identifying the, the mechanisms for aneurysm formation, we can try to prevent it. Do you think that with the uh, general aging of the population, with people living longer, and arguably taking better care of themselves with a reduction in smoking, what do you think the net effect is going to be on the volume of vascular disease? I think the volume of vascular disease uh, will continue to... Um, 
uh, uh, increase as we deal with the uh, uh, older population, especially with the retirement of the baby boomer generation. You know, California is a very good example of that because uh, people in California, my uh, observation has been that uh, they are healthier, they tend to be more active, uh, and, uh, you know, they live longer. You know, both, uh, both of us have taken care of patients well into their 90s who are very active and live independently. So I think we will continue to see that. Uh, I'm right now evaluating a 98-year-old uh, woman uh, who has a high, uh, you know, very um, tight carotid blockage. And uh, she wants it fixed because she is uh, a master pianist and, uh, you know, plays the piano uh, for an hour every day and doesn't want to suffer from a stroke. So we, we're dealing with an increasingly elder, elderly population, uh, especially in this part of the country. Well, you mentioned two of the very clear risk factors for atherosclerosis. One is uh, a sedentary lifestyle without exercising, and another would be smoking. I wonder what your thoughts are and what your counsel to patients is about diet modification and whether that really makes a difference. Yeah, you know, there, I would try to stay away. Personally, I stay away from fad diets. I would just uh, try to eat a healthy, balanced diet uh, that is rich in uh, vegetables uh, and uh, try to stay away from uh, the center of the grocery store, you know, uh, focus more of your attention on the fruits and vegetables in the periphery. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, eat what you like. I mean, I'm not a kind of a diet person, but I tend to exercise a lot. And um, stay away from cigarettes and, uh, you know, watch your uh, uh, blood pressure and your cholesterol. Well, you're building a terrific vascular unit here at Cedar sinai And I wonder uh, if you could sort of prognosticate over the next 10 years, if you were to visit yourself in your office uh, and in your operating room in the next 10 years. What do you think is the most likely new development that will change the way you do business in vascular surgery? I think we will continue to, uh, uh, you know, get better at uh, minimally invasive treatment of vascular disease. You know, we're, we're using, um, you know, uh, smaller holes to be able to treat these um, uh, vascular problems. Uh, I see imaging uh, becoming a more significant um, uh, part of our daily uh, medical practice. You know, we are um, now uh, looking at alternative um, imaging capabilities in the operating room where you use lower doses of radiation, uh, maybe less um, contrast or dye, which can be... Um, have adverse effects on the kidneys. Uh, so I see us doing more minimally invasive work. And of course, uh, in, in a institution uh, such as ours, uh, which is uh, what we call a quaternary center where patients are you know, transferred from other well-established institutions for complex problems, we're always gonna be doing a lot of open surgery. And um, we are uh, well-equipped to be able to take care of those patients. Well, it's really been a pleasure to hear from you and, and have a vision of the future for vascular surgery. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure.